advantage of it while it's here, right? It's still winter in Humboldt County. <laughs> hey, will you guys join with me? I, I want to just pray real quick before I get started. So, <laughs> Papa, I just thank you that you are here with us. We are so grateful for your son. And we are so grateful for your Holy Spirit that lives within us. I pray for an encounter for every person here this morning with you. I pray for a deep, deep surrender to you. I wonder if, if you guys, it might help just to close your eyes. Can you just picture Jesus standing right in front of you, looking you in the eyes, and smiling? He loves you so much. He loves you so much. Before I share this message, I want you all to know uh, that this message is born out of personal experience and a very deep conviction in my heart. I'm going to move this because I move around a little bit. I have some incredible friends that are with me. They know I move around a little bit too. They, they, these friends, they've followed me since I was uh, pastoring at, at Bethel and, and Eureka, and they are so supportive. <laughs> like They shock me every time I'm doing something, they show up. Jim and Celeste Durkin are here, and Sandy Purify. They are heavy hitters in the kingdom, so will you guys just get it, get it up for them? They're amazing. <laughs> So anyway, before I start this message, this is born out of, out of personal experience and personal conviction. And it's not, this is not an easy message. It's not an easy message to preach. It's not an easy message to hear, but it's one that I think is so necessary in our day and age. You know, I have a dream, I have a vision for my life that I believe is from the Lord. Uh, a, a dream of having a kingdom retreat center where pastors and leaders and other individuals, believers, can come and be rejuvenated and renewed and restored and re renew, remember their identity in Christ and um, really be motivated and inspired to go back into their communities and change their community. But sometimes, as I think about that dream, I think about that vision, I get a little bit, I, I begin to despise the day of small beginnings. You guys familiar with that scripture? See, he says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. And I begin to kind of get bitter about where I am now and, and maybe the place I live now and the house I live now. And one of the things Becca and I love to do, we love to go for hikes and go for walks around the neighborhood. And, you know, I, I look around, I'm like, oh, that would be a nice house. Or, or we go for a hike in the woods, and oh, look at this beautiful place. This would be an amazing place for a retreat center, right? Everybody would come here and just be totally refreshed and renewed. And then I, I begin to take for granted what God is actually doing in my life in the current season. <laughs> right. And I, I feel like I have a deep concern and again, I'm speaking this, I'm not up here on a high horse, okay? Speaking this from personal experience, but I have a deep concern for the church and the church in America, and even especially revival churches. That humanism and hedonism and materialism are invading our churches, the church, not just the building, the church. That is the philosophy or the belief or, or the system that says it's really all about us. It's all about what we want. It's all about our happiness. It's all about our self-fulfillment. It's all about our pleasure. It's all about success, worldly success. It's all about, and, and Sean shared a little bit of this too. I, I was kind of amazed, like, okay, Holy Spirit, you're doing something here. This is good. 
But it's a philosophy that says it's all about us and then we crouch it in these Christian terms. We crouch it in this is blessing. God wants to bless you. He, he wants you to just be happy. He wants you just for self-fulfillment. And I don't hear anything. I don't hear anything about sacrifice and surrender anymore. And I'm, listen, I'm not talking about religious obligation. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about being so in love with Jesus that it's a pleasure, it's a joy. Listen, it's because of the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross. I'm talking about responding out of a place of such deep love and reverence that sacrificing and surrendering to him is our joy. But I see this coming into the church and, and, and we say, bless you and bless that. And I feel like sometimes we're just selling the world a bag of goods that are no good. Well, if you come to Jesus, he's going he's gonna to make you really happy and you're going to have a house and a white picket fence and two and a half kids and two cars. <laughs> I don't know where that two and a half kids, uh, whatever. <laughs> you know, that's the American dream. That's not what Jesus calls us to. And I'm not saying, listen, there's nothing inherently wrong with those things, okay? I'm not saying that. It's not money that's the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. So don't mishear me. I'm not saying that he doesn't want to give us hope and prosper us and give us a good future. That's his promise to us. But I am saying when we idolize that thing, it takes away our relationship from God. And that's not what he wants. I believe we've been deceived. And I believe that we're doing the world a disservice by telling them, them that if you just come to Jesus, everything's going to be great. It's all going to be rainbows and unicorns. Jesus said, Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You ever think about that when you say blessings on you? <laughs> no, wait, <laughs> don't bless me yet. Well, what was this for? Jesus says, blessed are you when you're persecuted. We need a new perspective. A perspective that is not earthly, but is heavenly from the heavenly realm I'm tired of the church trying to lure people in by promising them something that Jesus never promised we promise people material blessings and happiness and worldly success a life free of pain or sacrifice then we wonder why they quickly become disillusioned a few months or a few years later when things aren't all rosy and rainbows and unicorns Why are we promising them something that Jesus never promised? Do you realize when, when Saul was on the road to Damascus and Jesus knocked him off his, his horse or his donkey, do you realize that Jesus actually showed him all the things that he would suffer for his name? And Paul said, I don't care. I have found my Lord and my Savior, the lover of my soul. And you are worth it all. Do you know what Paul had to suffer? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 29. Paul is defending his apostleship, and he says, Are they servants of Christ? I speak as if I'm insane. I am more so. And far more labors, far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been in frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? 
Who is led into sin without my intense concern? See, I love that Jesus never pulls any punches. He tells us how it is. Listen, I don't want to swing the pendulum so far where it's like, you know, Christianity is just all about suffering and that kind of thing, because that's not what I'm talking about. You guys heard me. I believe He wants to prosper us, give us hope and a future. But I believe we do a disservice to the church and to those we're trying to reach if we're not real with them, if we pull our punches, if we don't really tell them who Jesus is and what He requires of us. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will, it, will a man give in exchange for his soul? In Matthew 5.45 he says... He causes sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Just because you know Jesus doesn't mean that you're going to be absolved from all suffering, from all sacrifice. Peter says, why are you surprised that you're going through this fiery trial? Did Jesus not tell you that there were going to be times like this? Paul tells us to die daily. Daily. And listen, I understand that we're a new creation, fully. That is who we are. We are sons and daughters of, of our Father in Heaven. It's our identity. But every single one of us has to, every day, remember that we can be prone to follow our flesh and try to meet our fleshly needs. <laughs> as opposed to living in the Spirit. And I understand that's counter to who we truly are. It's counter to who God has created us to be. It's counter to who we are as we've placed our faith in Christ. But man, it's so easy to go that direction, isn't it? And it is something that we need to be aware of. The life I live, I no longer live for myself. But I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. We've fixed our eyes on this world, on the world system, many of us. But where's the surrender? I don't hear it preached about anymore. Where's the sacrifice? I don't hear it talked about anymore. I just hear about, if you come to Jesus, all your suffering's gone and everything's roses. You know, we, we had a, a worship night, what was that, last weekend? last weekend and we were just contending for the county interceding for the county breaking off chains breaking off depression and addiction and all these things and suddenly <laughs> this was so cool if you know Celeste at all she, she's pretty quiet most of the time but man she got a prophetic word and the girl was on fire come on <laughs> and now I'm totally embarrassing her right now which is great <laughs> <But she laughs> But she said, we, sometimes we get so caught up in, like, where a certain picture is hung, you know, in the church or whatever, where the plans go, or, or the image, or the smoke and the mirrors, you know, all that stuff. What about the lost? When did we stop praying for the lost? When did we start reaching out to the people that may not look like us, or act like us, or smell like us? Where's that sacrificial prayer? Where's the being driven to our knees? Because we want to see the kingdom of God expanding through the hearts and lives of the people that maybe don't look exactly like us. We fix our eyes on the world. Those little foxes get in and ruin the vine. What happened? We told Jesus we would give him everything. But as soon as, as betrayal or abandonment or, or, or stress or challenge comes in, we begin to wonder where he is. 
But he let us know. He was honest with us. He didn't pull any punches. Christianity, by its definition, is impossible to live from your own strength. If you're able to live this life in your own strength, the life of a believer, in your own strength, something's wrong. We have to depend on Holy Spirit to give us the strength to, to, to sacrifice and surrender. Again, not from a place of religious obligation. That's false humility. But from a place of love, from a place of gr gratitude that Jesus died on the cross for us. Do we forget what Jesus did for us? Do we so easily forget that? What he endured for us? What he went through for us? Being mocked, being beaten, being scorned, being spit on, being slapped, being whipped. Carrying his own cross to Golgotha and being crucified. And then entering into Hades and, and getting the keys of the kingdom for us. How could we ever be in a place where we're not so grateful that we want to lay down our lives for him? We fixed our eyes on the world. We fix our eyes on the success of the world and the world's standards. Material wealth, safety from our cushy cars and houses, and to feel good about ourselves. In my opinion, we've begun to preach a very humanistic message that it's all about us. It's all about what we can get from this belief system that we call Christianity. As though it were some kind of fairy dust that we sprinkle over our lives and we no longer have to suffer or endure. What about Jesus? What about laying down our lives for Him again? You know, pastor's word for this year is reset. Can we reset our hearts towards Jesus? That yes, we are willing to lay down our lives, to fully surrender. That we're willing to engage in, in prayer and intercession on behalf of those who don't know you yet. And on behalf of the persecuted church. What happened to our first love? What happened to that place in our hearts that said, I'll do anything and go anywhere for you, Jesus. I can never repay you for the love and acceptance that you've shown me. You know, that's when you have abundant life. You know when you have abundant life? When you lose your life. <laughs> Everything in the kingdom gets turned upside down. You have abundant life when you lay your life down and you surrender. And you say, yes, Jesus, you can have it all. Again today, you can have it all. You know, that entitlement thing, man, that's, that's just insidious, isn't it? Like, I deserve this, or I deserve that, or I deserve to be happy, I deserve to live a fulfilled life. No, Jesus, it's all about you. I want to live my life for you. I want to surrender my life to you. And I know that you're going to take care of all my needs because seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given unto you. And he says, it is my joy, it's my father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. We can trust that he's going to meet all of our needs. We can be thankful that He's going to meet all of our needs, that He's going to be with us all, all, every step of the way. But as soon as we start to be in charge of how we get our needs met, that's when we become, become, begin to worship false gods. Hebrews 12, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. There's a great cloud of witnesses cheering every single one of us on. Can we get that eternal view? Can we get that heavenly perspective? It's not just about the here and now. But they're cheering us on. So Paul says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, how many of you, when you were in grade school, you know, you had somebody teach you how to run a race? And what's the first thing they always say? Listen, keep your eyes on the finish line. Don't look to your right and see what, or you're right, you're right. <laughs> I could have totally played that off. But anyway, you're right. <laughs> don't look to your right or your left. Don't look at what, what Bobby's doing over here or little Susie's doing over here. You just look straight ahead and you run as fast as you can all the way through that finish line. And what do we always do? I wonder what they're doing. Wonder, who's it? Who's it? Who's it? And then all of a sudden we're off track. We're not running the race we're supposed to be running. You know, one of the things I really enjoy doing is, is backpacking. And about a mile or two into it, I'm like, why did I bring so much stuff? <laughs> I am climbing a mountain. <laughs> Why do I eat so much? <laughs> I am trying to climb mountains. And immediately I'm thinking, I don't need that much water. I'm just going to dump the water. I'm going to dump something else. Get rid of everything that hinders you. The sin that so easily entangles. Everybody knows the more stuff you're carrying, the slower you're going to be. And the quicker you're going to run out of steam. Keep your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. Don't worry about what this person's doing or that person's doing. Don't, don't get into that finger pointing thing where we're judging people. Don't get into all that stuff. Don't compare yourself to others. You have a race that is set for you. Every single one of us has the same finish line, but we've got different ways to get there as long as we're looking at Jesus and running towards Jesus. My race isn't going to be the same as yours. And it doesn't matter how far behind this person is or how far ahead that person is. Listen, I get around Jim, Celeste, and Sandy, and I'm like, I don't know anything. These people have been walking with the Lord for a long time. I won't say how many years. <laughs> a long time. I'm not to compare myself to them or to you or to anybody else. I've got to run my race. But if I allow sin to come in, that entitlement to come in, if I allow myself to get distracted, if I allow myself to be encumbered by those things, that's going to be a hard race to run. If I allow myself to look at the worldly success or the American dream or something like that, my eyes are suddenly off of Jesus and onto something else. It doesn't matter what it is. Fix your eyes on the author and perfecter of your faith. I want us to finish the race well. So that every single one of us can say like Paul did, even though I'm poured out like a drink offering on the, on the table of sacrifice. I've run my race well. I'm finishing my race. How do we do that? Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So let us fix our eyes on him. Let us finish the race with gratitude, with thanksgiving, with praise. 
Because Jesus died for us, gave up everything for us. You know, I heard a story, well, I actually read a story. It's a book called The Heavenly Man. If you haven't read that book, I encourage you to read it. You will think that you are not saved. <laughs> Anybody read that book in here? One up, one up in the balcony. All right, the rest of you, you should read it. I'm going to put a confessional in the back later on. You can confess to not reading that. <laughs> it's all about this Chinese man named Brother Yoon. And his ministry in the underground church in China and what he has had to go through, what he has had to endure at the hands of the Chinese government. It talks about him fasting for over 70 days, which I understand is physically impossible. But how many of you know nothing is impossible with Jesus Christ? Anyway, it tells the story of him in prison and they had a guard assigned to come and beat him every single day. And not just beat him, but beat him to the point that he was crippled. Because two times before, he had actually walked straight out of the prison and escaped. Somehow not seen in broad daylight by the guards in maximum security prisons. Remind you of anybody in scripture, Peter? So every day, this person, this guard would come to beat Brother Yoon to the place where he could not walk. But even though he couldn't walk, he could kneel. And every day, this guard would come in and find Brother Yoon on his knees praying. And he would yell at him, why do you pray? Why do you pray to this God that doesn't exist? Why do you keep doing this when you know that you're going to get beaten for it? And finally, after, I can't remember how long, but a long period of time, he was crippled, couldn't walk anymore. The guard comes in and he says, why? Why do you keep praying? Who are you praying for? You. I'm praying for you. And right then, that guard broke down in tears, repented, and received Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. I don't hear a lot of stories like that anymore. Not that they're not happening, because they are. They're happening all the time, all over the world. But because somehow we've, been, we've become inoculated in America by materialism and humanism and meeting our own needs and desires. Paul says, Whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ and may be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Now listen to this. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. How many of you have ever prayed the prayer, Father, make me more like Jesus? Yeah, you can raise your hand. That's okay. That's a good prayer. My question is, and, and listen, I ask myself this question too. How can we pray that prayer and expect not to enter into the fellowship of his sufferings? 
Because right here it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. In other words, how do you become more like Christ? How do you, how do you obtain resurrection power? Because guess what? We're all supposed to be walking in that resurrection power. Did you know that? You have the same Holy Spirit living in you that was the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, right? So you're to be walking in resurrection power. Anybody? Hello. Is there anybody? <laughs> Hello. Anybody out here? Anyone? How do we do that? We enter into the fellowship of his sufferings. Being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul is saying, I consider it all loss. I consider it all rubbish. This is coming from a man who was in power who was highly esteemed. All of his countrymen exalted him. He was, he was like the professor of professors and the, and the Pharisee of Pharisees, the Jew of Jews. He had everything he could possibly want. And he said, I consider it all loss. I consider it trash. I consider it rubbish. Rubbish. Because you know what I get instead of that? I get the lover of my soul. I get my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, living in me and through me. And He's worth it all. He's worth it all. He's worth being shipwrecked and imprisoned. And listen, he wrote those words from prison. He was in prison writing those words. Jesus, you're worth it all. So I just want to Will you guys actually, will you stand with me? If you are, if you're comfortable, no, I don't want to say that. <laughs> Holy Spirit is our comforter. Pray this if you agree with it, okay? Jesus, we repent for valuing our own lives more than yours. We repent for fixing our eyes on the world and the world system. Break off any deception that we're under. Empower us to lay our lives down again and fully surrender to you and your great love for us. Oh Lord, your beauty.
soft again make our hearts soft again and let us remember our first love the lover of our souls we are so grateful for your sacrifice we are so grateful You are worthy of it all, Jesus. Can we do, <laughs> can we sing one more? You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all, for from you are all things, and to you are all things, you deserve the glory. Sing that again. And you are worthy of it all. You the prayer team to come forward we want to invite you if you have never known Jesus he died for you 
He died to take the punishment that we deserved so that you could have abundant life when you lay down your life and receive Him as your Lord and your Savior. If you're ready to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I believe He died on the cross for me and was raised again on the third day. And that I want Him in my heart and I want to live the rest of my life for Him. We want to pray for you. We want to lead you through that prayer. We want to see salvation this morning and the angels in heaven rejoicing over new brothers and sisters brought into the kingdom this morning. And I also want to say, if, if you want to just engage in that, that repentance, you know, revival always starts with repentance. It always starts with a repentance and saying, Lord, soften my heart. I want to be on fire for you again. If you want to engage that more deeply or whatever, I want you just to come forward and you can receive prayer as well. And if there, you have any need, healing or healing and relationship, we want to pray for you. Amen. Amen. Blessings.